Real quick, before we get started, I have to read you a few reviews from our most recent band tea launch. So Nathan had said, you know, in a movie, when the main character first sees his love interest and everything slows down and the world just seems right. Well, that's how I feel when you put this on, immediately buying every other colorway and style of these. Wow. And he did go on to buy the other ones that we still had his size in the day he received his first panty. It's pretty incredible. Pretty awesome. Kate K said that this is the absolute best tea of all time, best of both worlds, great for training or lounging or just living. Literally, we'll never stop wearing these. And then Kate said... Best shirts ever. So happy to have another one to add to my collection. These are so comfy, and my two older ones have shown no signs of wear, even though I wear them several times a week. Wow. That is freaking awesome. Thank you guys for the reviews. And if you haven't grabbed a band tee, we'll have a link in the show notes or in the description. So you can go ahead and snag one and keep tagging us on Instagram, the physique development Instagram, Alex and I, we love to see it. And just thank you. Go yeah, check them out. Thank you guys <laughs> for supporting us. We appreciate it abundantly. Yeah. And it allows us to be able to keep coming out with more band tees and more stuff that we want you guys to be able to enjoy. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, before we get into today's episode, I did have a question for you of what is your stance on gift cards? Gift cards. Yeah. I don't think you need to have a stance on gift cards. What's the... I mean, do you like like getting gift cards as a no, gift? No, because I nine times out of 10 lose them. <laughs> and so that's always my problem. I know that I have... Um, there is a, a tailor here that I go to and your mom has gifted me many a gift cards to go to my tailor. And I've not used any of them because I don't know where they are. And I've lost them. Well, that seems like a very personal problem. It's a very for personal you. problem, but <laughs> that would be the reason I don't like gift cards. I love gift cards because I feel like if someone just gives me cash, then I don't end up spending it on what I would have if it was a gift card. I just end up like pocketing the cash and I'm like, cool, cash. But let's say if someone gave me like a Sephora gift card, then I would obviously go spend it at Sephora versus if someone gives me cash and says like it's for something at Sephora, I would just forget to go and get the thing. Yeah, I think it's a good idea if you want to get them something from a particular place, but you don't know exactly what they want. It's a it's the safest way for them to get exactly what they want with the money that you were already planning to give them for a gift. So I guess I like them more. My personal issue with them is that I lose them. And you so just that's need a, a problem. bigger wallet. No, I don't because I don't want a bigger wallet. <laughs> I would prefer, in, unless I'm carrying a fanny pack and and um, the the guys who are listening may agree, I just despise having anything in my pockets. I don't like anything in my front pocket. I don't like anything in my back pocket. I would just rather carry a fanny pack if I'm gonna have my things on me. Or I have this amazing wife who has all these beautiful purses that she loves to carry this is true. and she can hold my stuff. That's a, a, that's a pro tip right there. Pro tip. Buy your wife pretty purses. And she will likely carry your stuff for you. This is true. <laughs> Do you think that gift cards are impersonal? I don't think so. Because, I mean, if you were to get someone an Amazon gift card, pretty impersonal. I mean, there's not a whole lot that's specific about an Amazon gift card. But if it was something like the Sephora, I would say that they were they know that that's a place that you shop. They know that it's a place that you enjoy to get things. Um, so they just didn't know exactly what you wanted. Yeah. Where uh, are places that you would like a gift card to or where are places that you're shopping right now? <laughs> I mean, is this is this for someone? No, I just, just like, I just am curious. Okay. Um, places that I'm shopping right now. I don't feel, I feel like, like, like you have good recs and you just had all these great outfits and pictures on vacation. Maybe people want to know. Okay. I don't know, but maybe I would want to know. Okay. I do a lot of browsing. Mm -hmm. A lot of browsing. Um, so I do a lot of that on Kith. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to get me a Big gift card Kith to fan. Kith, that would be um, very much so appreciated. <laughs> Abercrombie was the place that I got majority of the outfits that I wore on vacation. So if any of the ladies out there or guys out there want to get it for their significant other or for their, you know, for you to wear as a dude, um, it was awesome. Abercrombie slaps for guys. It really does. It is killing it. 
and I was I was not I was hesitant when mm-hmm. I first was told that their stuff was nicer and um Thankfully, we have some great friends here that are uh, that work for Abercrombie and really pushed it forward of like, no, 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 it's different now. <laughs> it's much better now. And they were 100% right. Yeah. I, I don't think that I've gotten one thing from there that I haven't been a fan of or continuously worn or anything like that. And I feel like you get a lot of compliments, like even just out and about of random people being like, oh, I really like that. Or people we know asking you like where you got stuff. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Banana Republic. Oh, yeah. So Kith, Banana Republic, and Abercrombie would be the three places. And Goat. <laughs> I don't know if you can get a gift card to Goat. Um, I would rather not buy shoes on resale, but there's just scenarios in which that's the only place you can get them. Sometimes they're new, though. They're always new, but it's resale. But doesn't Nike have like certain ones they like give to like StockX and Goat? Or no? Well, you're still purchasing purchasing them at a resale well, price. Okay, yes, yeah. that is correct. That's more of what I'm talking okay. about. Yeah, I, I don't I don't buy used shoes. On. Well, yeah, I know you as a human being. Okay, used shoes kind of freak me but out. A they little kind bit. of freak me out. Yeah, in general. But uh, yeah, goat is is great when there's shoes that I just am obsessed with and I need to have. Yeah, for sure. Well, today's episode is actually an overrated and underrated. You guys seem to love it, and we wanted to give you some more. So if you have any topics that we haven't hit and you want us to put in the next overrated and underrated episode, then please leave the comment if you are watching this on YouTube. And if you're listening to it, there's always a form attached. It is a Google form, so it says that you can sign in, but you can still do it anonymously. So you're not, you don't have to sign in if you don't want to, but you can. Um, And then you can also get on our email list or ask us other questions. And we'd love to be able to help out there. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's get into it. Is direct core work overrated or underrated? For some of these, I think that we need to set some parameters because like that as just a broad stroke question, it's hard to say overrated or underrated because for a percentage of the listeners, it's going to be something that they're undervaluing, but there is going to be a percentage of the listeners who are overvaluing it tremendously. And so I I think that it falls right in the middle, depending on the person, because it, it could be something where you're spending far too much time trying to make your stomach or midsection look a particular way. And you think that doing these exercises and this quantity of repetitions is going to get this visual appearance to to be in place. Uh, Whereas you would probably be better off performing exercises under challenging weight that is going to cause you to brace harder and build tissue in that manner. Um, but there is still value in direct core work. I don't want to sit here and be like, you don't have to do any direct core work and just squat, just deadlift. And your core is going to look and feel amazing and function optimally. And those different factors, like there is going to be value to the particular person. So, um, that was a crappy answer to overrated or underrated, but I will end it with, it depends on the person. (laughs) I, I do agree with that because when I was thinking about this topic, I first thought about how I went a very long period of time of just thinking I didn't need to do any direct core work because I was doing these bigger movements like a squat or a deadlift. And so I felt that you don't really need to do direct core work. But when you were talking, I was thinking about when I first started fitness, I was doing so many crunches all of the time. But the I think the biggest gap between both of those things is I didn't truly understand how to use my core throughout different movements. When I was doing direct core work, I don't really feel like I was engaging my core because I didn't know how to engage my core. And when I was doing these bigger compound lifts, possibly I was engaging my core, but definitely not to the degree I am able to now. And a lot of that came from having to do different movements to understand my core learn how to breathe with my core, especially during hard movements and being able to kind of grow from that. So I would say the thing that is underrated is being able to get truly in touch with your core and not just doing core work. I will add and and give a concrete answer here that if you are 
consistently resistance training on a regular basis, you're squatting, you're deadlifting, you're doing your split squats, things that are really challenging your core, the thing that's undervalued is doing things like yoga that is going mm. to take you through different lengths and, and bracing in those different positions and challenging you in a different way than just being under a heavy load. Because for me, one of the things that as I implemented that and I was working with James uh, through all my breathing practices and those different factors, I was just like this center block. Like I was a, a Mm, I was just truly <laughs> a block that could not rotate, could not function optimally with my ribs. Like I was not in a good spot. And it was because I was just focusing on lifting as heavy as possible. Like I was great for that. And I had to get into a place where my core was functioning better. So I would say in that context, extremely under undervalued to go through different practices that are going to directly impact and improve the mobility and function of your core. Do you think that it would be even be separate if we did an episode that was over and undervalued? I think that it's I, maybe. I would say it's about the same. Okay. That's what I thought, but I was curious. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think macro calculators are over or underrated? I would say that the hate towards them is a little overrated. I think that people get a little bit out of shape of, I can't believe it's telling you this particular number. And I think that there can be some greater education around what the number is and it not being like, this is exactly what you have to eat. Let's see where we're at relative to where you're eating currently. Let's track a full day of what you're eating now and let's compare it to that calculator. Is it 700 calories of difference? Well, you probably don't need to be eating that particular amount of food. Um, is it within the ballpark? Well, it may not have been that far off. And I think that there's only so many variables that you plug into those calculators mm -hmm. to think that it's going to be the exact answer for you and exactly what you need to do for you to lose body fat or to gain muscle or whatever the situation is, is naive in thinking that that's the answer. And so in that context, I think that it is a stepping stone to get to the answer that you're actually after. It is not the answer that you're after. And so looking at it that way, I think that it is adequately valued because that's the function of what it should be. But the, the hate and the, um, kind of just like pushing it to the side. I think that that is extremely overrated. It's again, so funny because when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about so many people try to just go to macro calculators and think they're the, the shit. And you were thinking about how much hate that they get. Yeah. So just even showing that we're getting different things and what people are consuming. Uh, but I do agree with you, especially just how can you expect something that has such little information about you and such little data about what you've done or what you're currently doing to come to a conclusion that's extremely specific for you. You didn't spend a lot of time filling that out. You checked what your height, what your weight was, how active you are, and maybe two or three other things. And it spit out a number based on an equation that you could do yourself. And it's just kind of like BMI, how it is an equation, but it doesn't really give us the context of what's going on. Does that person have more muscle on their physique? That's obviously going to change that that one number isn't a fit for everyone or equal what you think it means. Right. Do you think that kind frozen bars are overrated <laughs> or underrated? Extremely underrated. I don't know if I've ever seen anyone else post about them. <laughs> I am passionate about these ice cream bars. They are so good. What are the flavors that I like? <laughs> <laughs> you like the chocolate peanut butter. Okay. And then the sea salt almond okay. chocolate. So the chocolate peanut butter is number one. Mm -hmm. The sea salt almond is also very good, but is certainly not as good as the peanut butter one. So if you have not tried them yet, are they just at the frozen the, kind yeah. bars they're in the frozen section and they're actually they say they're plant-based so i don't i can't say for sure if they're 100 percent dairy free but i'm pretty sure that they are vegan hmm. i don't know they're really good though i'm a, a big fan even the people in my life who do not care much about fitness and they are not snobs on their nutrition by any means 
still think that they're delicious, so I'll take it. Yeah, my sister was just eating one the well, other you day. Just outed her. She does care about her health and her fitness. Yeah, so I wasn't. I was. Get, I said, yeah, Little my tough. sister. Like the next conversation, comma, uh, she does care about her health and <laughs> cares about nutrition. That's not who I was talking about. But my sister was just eating it the other day and talking about how good it was. And my example was because she's the cheesecake girl, and so she's used to eating cheesecake, tasting that, understanding the richness, and still really enjoying this. I can agree with that. Okay, so don't gotta act like I'm some hater over here <laughs> trying to get me in trouble. I've actually still not tried the kind bars because well, I didn't. That's your own personal issue. I don't. I don't understand. This is like me losing the gift cards. I think that <laughs> this is something you need to address with yourself. It is, but I, I, I need to double check the ingredients to make sure it's because I didn't eat it for a really long time because I just assumed it had dairy in it because it looks like an ice cream bar. Okay. So I, I need to like really look at it and then just go for it. I need to change my own life. Yeah. Take control. Yeah. <laughs> Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. Is healthy at every size overrated or underrated? I'm going to have to say overrated. The reason for this is that that statement alone makes no sense. Because on both ends of the spectrum, I can have someone who is at the tail end of a contest prep being as lean as humanly possible, four or 5% body fat, whatever that is, that is not healthy. And at every size, that would that would fall into that category. And that's not true. On the opposite end of this, you could be extremely overweight. That is also not healthy. So I think that the intention of, of what that is meaning to be, of, of having a level of acceptance of where you're currently at, but understanding that you can make steps forward to be a better version of you, I think that that should be the core of what that's trying to say and not just be like, Everyone is healthy no matter where your body fat is, no matter how you take care of your body, no matter how or what you consume, everyone's healthy. It's like, that's not true. Like we need to be, everyone needs to be aware of this. It's a, a facade to try and tell everyone that that's the case. And so I, I, I think that, and, and the thing is, is that I'm, if I'm to say that someone is not healthy because of how they take care of their body, that's not me saying I hate you or that yeah. you suck or that you're the worst person. It's like, you're in this current situation. You can change this. It may be more difficult for you than what it was 10 years ago. It may be more difficult for you than the other person that you know, but you can still do this. Like you can get to a better place for you. You just have to put the effort in and you have to have the right tools in place. You have to have the right guidance in place, but you can get to a better position. We don't have to just sit here and be like, well, this is where my body composition is at. And this is how much activity I get. And this is what I uh, put into my body. This is just how it is. It's like, you can be better than that. Mm -hmm. And so with that uh, scenario, I would call it extremely overrated just because of the fact of it's not true. Yeah. I think that you can be healthy at multiple sizes. I can agree with that. And I, especially sitting here as someone the size that I am, I want to be very clear that I don't think health just looks like me whatsoever. Health can be multiple different sizes and you don't have to have abs or be a certain leanness to specifically be considered healthy or fit. That can look very differently on people. But exactly what you said, you can't be healthy at every single size. There needs to be personal accountability. And then there also needs to be the understanding that the top five leading causes of death all have a diet and or fitness related aspect. It's not always the cause of it, but it does move something in a negative or positive direction. And I think that there needs to be an emphasis on health and what health really is. It can look different, but it's not everything. Yes. And I don't think that it has to look, I think that individuals who like fall into this category may think of health as this like far-fetched thing that it's like impossible for them to be able to achieve. And it's like, it can be easier than what you're, uh, 
making it out into your mind to be because every day that you are going against the thing that you know is better for you, that thing gets more and more challenging. You create this, I mean, crazy facade in your mind of how difficult it's going to be to get this thing going. And in reality, if someone was to take the first steps of making their life better to a healthier version of themselves, getting steps in throughout the day, it doesn't have to be 10,000. If it's, if you're at 3000, it could be 5,000 do better within the nutrition that you're consuming? Do you have an idea of even what you're consuming? Are we just shoving down our throat what tastes good? Are we uh, mitigating our stress? Are we um, moving our body within resistance training? It doesn't have to be this like hardcore 60 minute training set. It could literally just be like 20 or 30 minutes, like move your body, challenge yourself with resistance and those different factors. Like it really can be that easy. And there will be stepping stones along the way as you get more acclimated to these different versions of what improving your health looks like for you, but it can start so small. And I think that that's the message that needs to be conveyed, um, to individuals who fall into this camp. Yeah. And you can still be healthy and eat kind frozen bars and astronomical Chick-fil-A orders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, I think I know your answer on this one, but do you think yoga is overrated or underrated? <laughs> I believe that yoga is underrated in the benefits that it can provide for everyone. Uh, because I, I do believe that doing a better job of managing your breathing, doing a better job of being able to move your body and work through rotation and, and have stability in times where you're um, standing on one leg or, or supporting on one elbow and one foot type situation. Like those have a lot of value to just how your body functions, how you feel. Um, and this is coming from someone who I thought it was silly. You know, I, I didn't think it was necessary. I thought that because I was resistance training hard and, and, uh, that was my overarching goal of, of hypertrophy and growing to be bigger and those things. Um, I thought that yoga was not for me, but honestly, what I was the most uncomfortable with was that I wasn't good at the thing. And I didn't like going into an environment that I wasn't good at it. Um, and once I just accepted that I was going to get better as I went and it was going to be something that I enjoyed and could incorporate into my schedule um, and accepted that and just moved through some of the uncomfortable and anxious moments, I suppose. Um, it was it was awesome. So underrated. <laughs> I highly agree with you. And I there's just so many benefits that I feel like I'm that kook running around telling everyone like you should do yoga, it'll benefit everyone. But it doesn't have to even look the same for everyone of how often you go or how you challenge yourself in the practice. Even if you were just to do yoga from home and really push yourself to just get into a place where you could breathe and focus on that mobility. I even talk to clients of when it comes to regularly stretching, I'm pretty piss poor at it. But yoga gives me a option and a place and a way to stretch that can fit into my routine and I can be consistent with versus trying to make a stretching routine for myself. And so being able to look at how you can utilize it and what it holds in your life and you don't have to become this huge yogi and it to become your whole personality, it can just be something that adds to your mobility, your uh, body awareness, your core activation, your rotation, and being able to do something that you have to get good at. There's so many different things that it can help you level up physically and mentally. I think that it it's always worth a shot to even see how, how you like it. Also, how many times throughout your day are you really getting an opportunity to get into a relaxed state and be just focusing on your breathing and calming down. Like there are so many people, myself included, you included, that as soon as you wake up, your day is a sprint. Yeah. And then until the time that you're getting ready for bed and then you're expecting yourself to just be able to turn it off and you're not like a light switch. Like we need to be able to have times throughout the day that we're able to decompress and get into more of a relaxed state. And yoga provides that in a way that I, I need it. Like it, it's something that I have to have in my routine because I could just go until the wheels fall off. And I often do, but then it, it forces me to slow down and I, I have to have that in my routine. Do you think that keeping a log book for training is overrated or underrated? Underrated. I actually <laughs> uh, made a post about this today and just speaking about 
if if your priority or goal is oriented around getting stronger in the gym or improving your body composition or um, improving the function of your body, you're going to have to have some things to draw back to of, is the plan working? Am I getting stronger? Am I improving the way that I'm I'm moving through these exercises and those different aspects? If you don't have the logbook and you're just like, yep, I did all the exercises, I did all the repetitions that I was supposed to, and then you just go into the next day and, and you think that you're going to remember. You're like, ah, I did it just a week ago. What, mm -hmm. There's stuff that I did yesterday that I probably said that to myself and I didn't write it down and I don't remember what it was. And like, that's the same thing within your training is that you're, you're going to think that you're going to remember, but you're probably not going to remember. And so then let's say that you run into a wall and you're having some trouble within different movements and those different aspects, you don't really have anything to draw from. So you're just like, I, I guess I need to change something, but I have no idea what it is. Or you think that you've hit this plateau and then you go back in the log book and it's like, it's not a plateau. It's only been a couple of weeks. Like I just need to keep chipping away at this and getting better at it. There's things that I've actually progressed in over this time frame. I just need to not be so focused on this one aspect of my training that I'm like, I'm hitting this plateau. I need to change whatever the situation is. And so it just gives you better reference points to make better decisions towards the goals that you have. I'm so glad you used the word plateau because that was what I was thinking of so many people and even me before I started consistently logging different metrics would just say like, I'm stuck or I'm not making as much progress as I want to. And I even have clients who will be like, I don't feel like I'm progressing at all. And I will call back to the data that we've collected of either their scale weight, their sleep, their water intake or their training logs and be able to say like, just the progress in the past two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, like we're making progress. And if you don't have a measurement, you can't gauge what that progress is and you can't manage what might need to be changed within that either. And you cannot remember every single number. You have so many things going on in your day to day. You're supposed to remember every exercise, what exact weight you used, how hard it was and what the extenuating circumstances were of that day. Like there's so many times that I go into it and I compare it and I'm like, I feel like I'm not progressing. And I look back and I'm like, oh my gosh, this was so much stronger than last week. Uh, and even being able to see a week where I might feel way weaker. And I look and I'm like, oh, I also didn't get great sleep. I was in a place that my cycle was starting and I was really high stress. That makes sense why this was so much lower and why I was able, able to have these changes in my weights. So I think it is so invaluable. And I have consistently had a logbook for seven or eight years at this point. And it's when I've seen, you know, the most progress it's in my fitness journey. So yeah. I 100% agree. Keeping a logbook is underrated. And if you are not keeping a logbook right now, you are doing yourself a major disservice when it comes to what your goals are. It is summertime. And with summer comes vacations and needing to look like a smoke show at the beach. And that is probably you and wanting to get in the best shape of your life. With Physique Development, our one-on-one -on -one coaching is going to do that for you. So head over to physiquedevelopment.com and inquire to work with one of our coaches. Do you think that French food is underrated <laughs> or overrated? I am not sure that I could even define French dishes. So I don't know if I'm the best person to ask on this topic. But um, I'll go for it. doesn't matter. Uh, we were in St. Bart's and I love the dishes. And so I don't even know what the consensus would be for French food. I mean, this is really <laughs> invalidating my, <laughs> my input here. I'm going to put underrated <laughs> because I didn't hear enough about it <laughs> beforehand. And mm -hmm. so it was, it was delicious. I loved every moment of it. So I'll say underrated. As a top chef lover, I've learned that French food is kind of like the mother of cooking and it's everything with Julia Child and it's all kind of spreads down from French cooking. But I didn't really know what French food was until and like St. Bart's is a French island and a lot of the food was more French and it was kind of like a fusion of French and Caribbean, I feel like, as far as having fresh fish. I don't know how much fresh fish is in France. I the, I'm the worst person to ask on this topic. <laughs> but the food we ate was stellar. If that all falls into the category of French, then yeah, I will say. Then underrated. it was underrated for sure. Yeah. If not, then who knows? But if you're saying that it's ranked as like the creme de la creme top tier thing, then I would say adequately. Yeah. 
I think I should be a Top Chef judge. Top <laughs> Chef, if you're watching this. <laughs> sure. That's probably convenient. definitely watching this fitness podcast looking for new judges. Yeah. But, you know, just in case. <laughs> Do you think that foam rolling is underrated or overrated? I would say probably overrated. I think that oftentimes when individuals are, are dealing with excess soreness and those different factors, I think there's more to look at in that context than leaning into the foam roller and being like, this is my saving grace to be able to get to a better spot um, and better evaluating other recovery modalities. Um, the The research is not fantastic in support of foam rolling. I don't have anything to pick directly off of my top of mind to to speak to, but um, it's not something that I incorporate a whole lot into my regiment and uh, not something that I overly advise to, to clients and those different things. So I would put it in the overrated category. Yeah. I was going to bring up that there's just really not a ton of research on it, but I don't think it's negative either to do. Just exactly. It's one factor of recovery. And we don't want to lean way too heavy on one tool or one factor when there's many other things that we can be focusing on um, and just not put too much on that one thing. Do you think that protein shakes are underrated or overrated? I would say adequately rated for the sheer fact of they are such a great tool of being able to get more protein in. And um, I have been dependent on protein <laughs> shakes for over a decade at this point. And you always speak to my dedication He's of dedicated <laughs> to the shake. getting protein shakes in. I just think that it's the easiest way to to get 40 to 50 grams of protein in. Like it does not compute in my head when clients are at 120, 130, 140 grams of protein. And they're like, I'm struggling to get to this number. And I'm like, you could literally just have two scoops of protein. And that is going to get you, if you're at 120, almost halfway there. Yeah. I mean, and it takes 30 seconds. So I don't know what the problem is. I, <laughs> I cannot understand. And then you just have, like, you can almost stumble your way there through trace protein. If your goal is 120, you have two scoops of protein. You could almost stumble your way <laughs> through trace protein within your carb sources and your fat sources to get to 120. So I, I, that, that one's tough for me. <laughs> I, you are so dedicated to the protein shake and just you have one at least once a day, I feel like, if not sometimes twice, just to hit your protein goal. Just depends on where my protein's at. If it's at, you know, 200 plus, it, it just makes more sense digestion wise to have a shake and like cream of rice and something easy to digest somewhere throughout there. Cause I just have realized that as I've gotten older, having four and five like full meals does not fit into my day. Yeah. Like four is the cap. I could not pa push past four and have like five or six full meals. Oh my meals. gosh, no way. Yeah, my digestion wouldn't love it. My schedule as a whole of like the things I have to attend to, it's not feasible to do. It would be a massive distraction to go that route. So having the shakes and having things that are more simple to eat and quick are huge benefit for me. You're very interesting because you kind of sit in the middle between I don't care, I just need to get it in and you do actually want things to taste good at the same time. And I was thinking in regards to the whole pet peeve question, because you will sometimes be like, I don't care, it's just whatever to me, but you do have a preference, but you don't care but you have a preference. And I just want to know your preference because I was getting Gatorade Zeros and he was like, I don't care, get any of the flavors. And they were out of ones that I thought he wanted and they ended up getting like a ton of the Glacier Freeze or the clear one. And he's like, this is just like my least favorite flavor of Gatorade. The fact that you consider that flavor to be clear is well, water what, is clear. What else would you call it? White. I mean, it's not white. Okay, David, please put on the screen, put a glass of water. Uh, well, I, I want a glass of water, not, which is clear. I didn't say it was comparable to water. I just said clear if that's what you call it. I didn't know. I would like a, a vote. So if you're listening to it oh, on any podcast gosh, platform. Here we go. Here's head, another pet peeve. Head over, head over to YouTube now. So David, bottle or glass of water, Gatorade, Glacier, Glacier Freeze Zero. Mm -hmm. Is the Glacier Freeze white? Or is it clear? Or is it something else entirely? Sure. Those are our three answers. 
<laughs> I look forward to hearing everybody's response. And you know, we got to give a major shout out to David right now, because let me tell you, the last podcast we filmed, um, Miguel was not here. He was in Colombia, you know, doing his thing. And we put it up and got everything going. And we had some mishaps between cameras going out and just, you know, all the things. And David still made it look good. I mean, yeah, he's he, a superstar. He's just the goaded. Yeah. So shout out to David. And speaking of last episode, just have to thank you guys so much for all of the the just prayers and kind words and everything. It did not go unappreciated or unnoticed. Uh, I've been trying to make sure I get back to everyone, especially since a lot of them um, are on Instagram that I'm getting back to. Uh, but it is so extremely appreciated. Uh, my family appreciates the support so much. I sent my mom a bunch of screenshots this morning of a lot of really sweet and encouraging things that you guys said. And my dad's actually there at his appointment right now. Um, we'll get an update a little bit later today. But just just really, really thankful. I, I like, I was so overwhelmed with the love that I got yesterday. Um, and yesterday was like a hard day, but it ended up like ending pretty good and like feeling good about things. And I just had been very anxious the past few days. And um, so very thankful for that. <laughs> but on the topic of protein shakes, do you think Legion protein is underrated or overrated? So I think that it is underrated because of the quality in which that it is. It's a grass-fed whey isolate with no artificial sweeteners. So from a digestive perspective, I don't think that there's a better one on the market. The one thing that I do run into with clients is that if they are accustomed to having a lot of artificial sweeteners within their protein powder, um, this is not a knock on, on ghost protein because people do really like mm -hmm. ghost protein, but there are a lot of artificial sweeteners in their product. And so if you go from drinking ghost protein to drinking Legion's protein, Legion's protein is gonna taste off to you. It's gonna have kind of a, just a different aftertaste to it. Um, that will subside as, as you're no longer having those artificials, you know, more commonly on your palate, if you will. But that would be the only knock that I have. So I haven't experienced that myself. Mm -hmm. I have gotten that from clients who have made the transition to, you know, trying the protein relative to what they were having previously. Yeah. Or anyone just switching from having artificial sweeteners to stevia, even something like an energy drink of I've had friends that have had something that has the artificial sweeteners and they like hate the drink with stevia and I think the stevia tastes fine. So there's always going to be a preference of certain people, flavor preferences that don't match. And what I always do when it comes to reviews or recommendations is being able to look at what that person has recommended else that I've liked and also being able to know my own taste. And especially with things like clothes of someone will say like, I love this piece, you should get it. And it's like, I really look at it and it's like, it looks great on you. I'm so glad you love it, but it's not going to be a piece that I love. And so really being able to be an educated consumer in that, but also know that you're not going to agree with every single person's likes. You might like a whole ton of it. But. Well, I, I will say that the, the cocoa cereal from Legion is one in which if you don't like it, you're wrong. <laughs> and that, you know, you may not like the other flavors, but the cocoa cereal. The cinnamon cereal. Uh, well, the cocoa cereal is better cinnamon. than the cinnamon. It's okay. The cinnamon's okay. You have cinnamon every single day. Well, that's not necessarily by choice. It's by choice that you want pancakes every day and the pancakes got cinnamon. Oh. You've never asked for them to be made with cocoa. I don't think they would taste as, as good with the cocoa. Interesting. Yeah. I'm going to lose this one. It's okay. <laughs> uh, do you have any other things that you want to see are underrated or overrated before we leave? Oh, we're leaving the episode right now. Well, I mean, we're, we're getting to that hour time frame. I mean, just didn't know Our if we were going to wrap it. Our self-application tanning products overrated or underrated uh both at the same time that's interesting yes because they are underrated in the fact that they have come a long way and they do just boost your confidence and i think that there's nothing better than having a tan it's the best feeling ever uh but they are overrated in the fact that i hate them you hate them I, it's a hate love hate relationship okay because i hate applying self tanner and i hate like the things that come with self tanner, like the smell or getting like splotchy or something like that. But I hate being pale more. So it's like a trade off of it makes me the happiest when I'm tan, but 
it's like I hate doing it. I can I can understand that. I think that's life though. Like yeah. you are are making decisions of oftentimes the thing that you hate less yeah. in in those scenarios, you know? So I'm not much for the uh, self-application tanner, but I will say that it's underrated in the sense that it makes my wife happy and, um, you know, and sh- it makes her feel more confident. Yeah. So I'm all for it. Yeah. And you love having a tan too. It's a great I do love having, having a, tan, a tan, but I don't think that I'm committed enough. I don't, I don't dislike being pale enough for me to apply self-tanner on myself. It's you, well, you don't get to the paleness that I do. This is true. But you also... I feel like you can pull it off a little bit better. That's Maybe interesting. it's because you don't get to the level of paleness. And if you got to that level, I'd be like. I also just pick colors within my clothing that if I'm paler, like there's just clothes that I will not wear because it does not look good on that skin tone. Well, yeah, I mostly wear dark clothing. I, I, I'm not saying that you don't. I'm. Well, you made that really seem like no, no, I no. didn't. You just said that I pull off being pale better. I was saying there's a complimentary component to that, and I have specific clothes that I cannot wear when I'm that pale. But my, I just feel like I look sick when I'm full pale. I wouldn't call it sick. I would just say that you do get very pale at your core. At my core. Very true. Yeah. But, you know, self-tanner on today. That's so right. we're we're feeling good about it. Exactly. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for joining us. I know in the last one, a few of you guys commented and said you'd be interested in some longer episodes. So if you have anything or just want us to chat kind of like we did last time, then let us know. That's how we gauge a lot of feedback, um, whether it's on Instagram or on YouTube or podcast, is who is subscribing, who is leaving reviews, who's commenting, thumbs upping thing. That all is a great way to give us feedback. So we ensure that we continue to put out stuff that you guys enjoy and that is helpful for you because I don't just want to sit around and hear myself talk. I really want to be able to provide helpful resources, free resources for you guys um, to be able to utilize. So uh, make sure that you give us some of that feedback and grab a band tea and we will catch you in the next episode.